We began this research this past year with a budding interest in the World Expo in Japan and in 1970, an event known around the world and famous in design and architecture circle, but also by the end of the size and the scope of a World's Fair as central to conversations in international politics, trade and manufacturing. Um, Hong Kong's involvement stood out not because we have done research on the Expo, because, but because of its involvement was um, advertised as we'll talk about um, in the press for the event as a whole. Um, sorry, I'm just going to pull out the PDF. Mm -hmm. Even in the sunset years of the British Empire, the colonies being, um, being stand out um, among the exhibitors were remarkable. We know that in the late 60s was a period of significant social, economic, and cultural changes in Hong Kong in the light of which Expo seemed to be an interesting and fruitful way to inquire into this prominent role really clear, even from a distance. And so we began to unfold the diversity of these changes, and since many of them were tied to design and architecture, we thought, why not ask Empress to help us about Hong Kong's history, to start an open-ended and exciting line of inquiry unfolding Hong Kong's architectural development as a function, and of more importantly, as an agent of co-war soft power, was a significant driver of this project. Um, for all we have is Empress for the generosity and the support for our research. I actually um, equal uh, Jennifer and Tina and everyone for the team who is supportive of our research and who were so kind to us even would have taken the best seat of the TST office. Um, we also have the design trust and especially Marisa to thank. Um, we also have to thank Irene Ho and uh, Mr. Kan Tai Kung whose stories and generous contribution help push such a work forward. And even though they were back and forth, we're grateful to the TDC, the Trade Development Council, and also the HKU Library Special Collection for their support and patience with our last minute pull request. Um, we're also grateful for the staff of the Public Record Office, and finally our friends who has come from um, different places of the world from their own projects and are here today. Um, so, back. By close examination of Hong Kong's pavilion in the Osaka Expo, we hope to move from a framework that focused on how a late booming and sporadically referenced modernism was developed in the Far East towards one in which intangible actors in design come into the field of vision. More specifically, we'll look beyond the finished architecture and display of the Expo to examine how design was understood and deployed by colonial officers and traders with no training in either aesthetics or design. What we, what we hope to be, make clear in the course of this research was that despite the lack of training, design was, without a doubt, seen as a carrier of considerable political weight. And more to the point, that it was seen as having some agency. By relocating design in trade and manufacturing, Hong Kong's otherwise marginalized history, history of design appears to be a powerful agent immersed in the mechanization of colonial governance, welfare state projects, and the politics of the Cold War. Um, In 1970, Hong Kong sent a pavilion to Osaka for the World Exposition, the first ever held in Asia. A modest title, Progress and Harmony for All Mankind. The exposition was, in the word of Ram Kuhas, a parade, quote, a parade of icons and architectural Olympics post-Tokyo 64. Um, end quote. For the national pavilions, Japan erected a light letter structure with a roof 30 meters above the ground, under which millions of visitors pass learning about Japan's history and its technological future. Pro progress um, for a march may not have been clear in any of the exhibits, but it was at the very last fought over, as in the USSR and the US played Cold War politics out in the pavilions. The former richer higher than the en any others at the fair, and the later lower. Canada took to a less dramatic stage to play out, play out its politics, doing so in three pavilions to represent Canada, British Columbia, and Quebec respectively. Japanese and international corporate pavilions epitomized technological optimism and the overwhelming strong consumerism of the post-war world. The exposition was, in short, an exuberant display of politics of trade, industry, and science, 
showing through design that Asia has already pulling ahead of the project of modernization. Um, Hong Kong's participation was all but fate to be a naughty one. Um, Fu Osaka was the first time Hong Kong has a pavilion in its own name. The colony had already had a long history of being um, in exhibition beginning in 1851. So there's a timeline of major events related to Hong Kong and the key pavilions that it has been participating. Um, the particip their participation, Hong Kong's participation was from the beginning forward. Um, the British, having spent decades at war with China, establishing treaties favorable to the empire, uh, found the Qing government was not enthusiastic about sending goods to the Great Exhibition of 1851. British ingenuity led to disaster as goods from Hong Kong, taken in a treaty from China only less than a decade earlier, were substituted as facsimiles of those from the mainland. Victorian crowds who are already familiar with the quality of Chinese craftsmanship respond poorly to the stand-ins and then bust Hong Kong from the subterfuge. The new colony continued to fare poorly um, in the decades that follow. The island, poor in natural resources, make a weak showing at the Indian and colonial exhibition held periodically to showcase the strengths of the colony. Um, that was the Um, sorry, um, Hong Kong was neither the skilled Far East or was not a good colony. It was worthy pointing out the curator and organizer of the colonial exhibition was Dr. Ho Kai, a physician and influential pol politician after whom the Kaita Airport was named after. Through the legacy of this curator is still much present in Hong Kong's history, exploring the role in the region are by and large untold a great deficit that retards our understanding of Hong Kong's modernization project. Many of these issues come to rest among a, a, almost 100 years later in Osaka. Before the pregnancy and forbearance of the pavilions, there was the exposition's PR. Hong Kong was the ninth participant confirming their participation in the Osaka Expo, thus guarantee its eventual prominent and generous site in the final Expo. It was similar in size to the British Pavilion, de designed by the luminary uh, James Durbin right next door. Um, without pavilions to show, the literature announced only the participating regions uh, before the exhibition was opened. 76 and one special in administrative zone. The quote um, is dedicated to Hong Kong. Hong Kong was, of course, the addendum because the colonial government commit a pavilion early in the process. The anonymous state was made all the more conspicuous. Um, Graham Brando, who is the director of the pavilion, sees upon the incongruent identity of Hong Kong and in a letter to the exposition plan, in a letter to the exposition planning community wrote, Quote, on every occasion that the ever ascending total of participants was announced at any conference, Hong Kong was always mentioned specially by the name at the very last. From the publicity point of view, this is an immersion value to us. So speaking of publicity, this is a picture of Grand Bando with um, Princess Margaret who's visiting the construction site of the pavilion. Um, other conspicuous visitors um, include a very young uh, Prince Charles. Um, and this is the uh, um, um, sketch of the eventual pavilion. Hong Kong Pavilion's architect, British-born Alan Fitch, set his design apart from the field by turning to the colony's past rather than to its techno future. This is to say nothing of the advanced state of its industry in just that moment of the 1960s. Um, in the Osaka Expo, um, Fitch drawn on the image of Hong Kong as an antagonistic as they were central to the decades of representation of Hong Kong and would be for the decades to come. The, the pavilion was meant to look like a sampan, a fisherman bow with a severely curved bow, um, hull and a bat wing cell sitting on the water. At the base of the pavilion, Fitch designed a, so a solo reflective pool on the um, roof 
of um, and on the roof of one star pavilion has the cell mounted. Um, for anyone who's familiar with Hong Kong's architecture historiography, the pavilion is visible at all with Fitch's other work, most notably to the City Hall designer in 1956. The City Hall building is known for its curtain wall design, which gave by then still largely exclusive activity of music concert and performance a transparent and modern facade. Um, although the Bad winds, commonly known as junks in Hong Kong, were manufactured for the pavilion with propriety nylons and underwent wind tunnel test in the Hong Kong University's engineering department. The design prioritized Hong Kong's humble origin over the 1960 reality. Um, Fitch alone was not responsible for the pavilion. He worked with a camaraderie of agencies. These are just image of them. Um, including the Information Service Department, who is like um, the key organizer of the Expo Pavilion for Hong Kong, the Trade Development Council, which was um, responsible for um, part of the design of the pavilion, and several others. If the sort of letters we just used is overwhelming, much of the rest of the talk will go into further details of these different bureaucracies. Um, this will be some of you for clarifying why for others only lead you down to further confusion. Good Godspeed. Uh, inside the pavilion, the narrative of progress was explicitly remarked upon, but unevenly developed. Visitors pass through a linear path ensuring, ensuring their movement from the beginning to the end would be defined by the agencies involved. If you were confused by the onslaught of acronyms, the rest of this talk would be about them, so um, be careful. Um, and this is already pointed to the confusions take solace in believing that the visitors to the Hong Kong pavilions would, would, would be experienced. Each session suggests Hong Kong's coming into a new age of progress with session entitled Social Progress, Industrial Progress, and Culture and Tourism, um, Cultural Heritage and Tourism. But the display and information will be unevenly developed and in some cases very annually at odd with the session's title. Um, you have now seen what is very near to, if not actually exhaustive selection of the photos of the interior of the pavilion. The absence of moving image was conspicuous and one can only guess since there's a total dearth of information, curatorial or otherwise, about the choices of what to include in the free sessions that the decision to use plastic gas was an attempt to how close to the message a literalization of medium is the message. Maluhan's famous face written three years before um, in his book of the same name. Um, so while movies would be later be historicized as Hong Kong's identity, they were kept out of the scene at the moment when the technology was already widely available um, and, in their state design, in, and in their stead, design and advertisement was thrown into one another as Hong Kong was sold on the very material support the colony's most recent industrial boom, known commonly as its plastic wear products. The collection of the image of the interior of the pavilion are, um, are lacking. Just as this last week, our colleague was doing research on the objects in the Hong Kong Expo, reached out um, with a similar answer that is so little can be found in the archive. Hong Kong has a terrible history of holding onto its record and of making its past available for research. We found in other projects here that records are regularly thrown out or kept so poorly that they are as good as lost. If we read this thin institutional history, not just as an unscrupulous record keeping and instead asking how it is a curatorial strategy, or at least reflect the curatorial intent that we left asking how to understand the pavilion's interior. Our claim is that this lack of images of the interior of the millions visitors, aside from the few London stars that we have just seen, or even a close record of what's being kept, suggests that we ought to see this is a weighting of the exterior in the context of the politics of engagement as in the pageantry that Ramka House, Aubrey and Alter has called a parade of um, icons.
question for the next um, Visitors follow a night path passing through three aspects of Hong Kong life. The first, industrial progress, displaying goods commonly um, manufactured in Hong Kong, such as camera, watches, and clothing, reprojected into plastic glass boxes. Wall text emphasizing the stability and strength of the manufacturing and logistic industry on the islands. In culture and tourism, live demonstration of jade and ivory carving from craftspeople draped in an aura of authenticity garnered the most attention. Um, through likely and unwittingly, this session was pointedly reproduced the vision of the colony first made popular in 1864's Indian and Colonial Exhibition in London. This skills has by then been moved to the anthropological collections of the Peel River Museum and the Honolulu Museum near London. Um, the social progress session was perhaps the most puzzling element of the Hong Kong Pavilion. Um, the architect responsible for the design of this session was Jackie, Jackie Wong of Wong Ao Yeung, um, then a relatively young office established by um, architects originally from China, and they are still a very um, established office today. Um, the session, entitled Girl, Girl in the Crowd, told the story of Chan Mei Ching, a fisher girl far from Hong Kong's business districts. The story opened with the image of Mei Ching posing on a boat with a hat, characteristic of the Tan Ka people, um, a minority group that live around parts of the South China Sea. The story proceeds to reveal Mei Ching making her way through progressive stage of modernization, appearing in first in an electronic factory and adapting to the lifestyle of the modern city. In the last frame, Mei Ching exchanged her Fisher Girl clothing for a um, mini dress with flatter color and is pictured standing in a crowd of people whose lives appear to have taken a similar path. The display did not hold back from explicitly guiding visitors' interpretation of the story, letting them know that Mei Ching was a sign of the adaptability of Hong Kong's population. At the first glance, Hong Kong's pavilion appeared to be a confused and not altogether unreasonable attempt to frame the colony as a valuable asset, a reliable manufacturer of cheap consumer goods, logistic hub, and enterport. If Hong Kong was not its technological neighbors, it would nonetheless occupy a place in the market. Cruise, However, as to how to unpack the design and the narrative of progress of the pavilion come quickly when in the course of our research, we went back a bit further in the archive to look at the period when Hong Kong's government was signed on to appear in Osaka. So we might ask when and why, given the history of exhibitions we've already heard, did Hong Kong send a pavilion to Osaka? Uh, the history of pavilions had to date been an exercise in being dragged through the mud, and though there had been excitement about the 67 Expo, a uh, famous one in Montreal, the government was so badly organized uh, for these kind of things that the sampan they sent for that exhibition as well uh, made it only as far as New York, some hundreds of miles south of the Expo. Uh, and so while this was not yet a memory even of a failed engagement in Expos, uh, the Hong Kong government decided, uh, let's try again. Uh, so why in 70? The announcement to participate was made in 67, and if for some of you in the room, this seems conspicuous, just wait. The Information Service Department, the government body responsible for press releases and photo documentation of events, announced that it would lead the organization of the exhibition and frame their participation as a simple matter of trade promotion. Quote, the, and they, they wrote in their announcement, the design of the Hong Kong exhibit will emphasize progress in the development of reclamation, mass housing, and other projects, together with an account of Hong Kong's successful transition from entrepot trade to a leading manufacturing center. It will have the effect of enhancing the image of Hong Kong overseas and will help to show the government's complete confidence in the future. This kind of complete confidence we found in our research to be conspicuous in the worst of ways. In the 24 hours before their announcement on the 8th of June, more than 500 people had been arrested while on strike at several of the city's privately owned public goods providers, a bus depot, the water department, and the gas company. Workers sidelined by rapid, in, by rapid industrialization through the post-war period, thinning protections, and increasingly dangerous conditions were goaded by the leftist seal making its way over from China. 
By the time the Hong Kong Information Department made their announcement about participating in the expo, Hong Kong was in its third month of protests. Strikes became violent at that point as police increasingly used force and protesters turned to guerrilla fighting. So we might imagine that Osaka was set as a horizon for the next phase of Hong Kong's modernization, a promise that the tumult of the late 60s, still very much tumultuous, would be eclipsed by the much more striking media effect of the Expo. If the Expo was the future of Hong Kong, a means to assuage fears and restore confidence, building towards that end meant turning to the more pressing matters at hand. The announcement made by the ISD and on the next day by the TDC marked the development of two strategies to use design to deal with the shakeup of the protests and engage bureaucracies in charge of manning Hong Kong's manufacturing image uh, that these, these groups would pursue. The expo in Japan was a horizon towards which uh, Blundell, the exhibition designer, uh, pursued with curator's efficiency and an administrator's drive. Through him, a wide range of bureaucratic agencies would be engaged to hold competitions, and perhaps most importantly, Alan Fitch, we've already heard, would be named as the, uh, the architect of the pavilion. Sometime, excuse me, in 1967, uh, the same year, the Information Service Department um, was engaged in developing these booklets, uh, which serve as international marketing uh, arm for Hong Kong business manufacturers and service providers. excuse me, by the TDC. Sometime, however, in 67, we're not yet sure, really, the TDC helped initiate a turn from what uh, you might have expected of a group like this, uh, these booklets, uh, advertising the strong backs of its workers in the stable economy, to more exciting developments. These developments were a turn more definitely to design as a means of self-promotion. In early cases, the TDC funded and hired designers to create the truck shown here on the left. Uh, a mobile exhibition tooling around Africa, and in what is either an extension of Hong Kong's love of gray legal zones or an unusual act of bureaucratic subterfuge, the, show, the truck is shown in the center, uh, unfolded in the middle uh, here, parked at the Nuremberg Toy Fair, uh, and explicitly not within the fair, as they had not been invited. Uh, so since the truck was had just shown up, uh, it unfolded as you see it here, uh, opened the back and invited international guests to play with the toys. Uh, so instead of designing and manufacturing for Americans and other overseas brands, the TDC hoped to cultivate Hong Kong industrial products as internationally recognized goods. The TDC even had a few in-house designers who produced fashion and product designs to serve as precedents for local manufacturers. The goal of the HKTDC was to help connect Hong Kong industries uh, to international markets, exposing them um, to, new, to new markets. At home, the HKTDC and the ISD devised a week of events uh, they called Hong Kong Week, celebrating local development. These were hastily put together by all means, uh, and the week was shown as a hodgepodge of events that included a book fair, displays of coin collections, a fashion show, a Chinese opera, and a cricket match. A new word, guofo, uh, or Hong Kong goods, was coined to decisively dis uh, distinguish goods made in Hong Kong from those made in China, and a new slogan, Hong Kong people should use Hong Kong goods, emerged with it. While no such distinction was possible, as a category of manufacturing, material and goods, to say nothing of designers, workers, and capitals, passed readily over the border with China and between trading partners in Southeast Asia. You can see here, in a single page uh, from a local paper, that gets to work historic, historicizing the protests immediately. It reads that the protests were not continuing through Hong Kong week uh, in this third month, but were explicitly antagonizing it, trying to, quote, disrupt Hong Kong week. Perhaps until, uh, perhaps until alternative facts, a more sympathetic historicization had not yet existed. Ongoing and deeply entrenched protests were transformed into a reaction to an antagonistic of all things celebratory of Hong Kong. The protest became a pointed rejection of an identity that was created only later and transformed by a week designed specifically to tamp down the protests. Alongside the HK uh, TDC and the IS, along the, uh, alongside the HK TDC, the ISD collaborated on another event, the HK PPE, shown here. This is the Hong Kong Brand Product Expo. The HK BPE 
was then a decades-old remnant of a nationalist project encouraging, encouraging Chinese people who had suffered from decades of foreign inv invasion and oppression to imagine a stronger nation through industrialization and economic independence. What you see here is what is called in architecture a weird object. Having spent so much time with these objects, however, we will continue to argue that this box, uh, one of the pavilions of the Hong Kong uh, BPE, was created with the highest levels of design as a strategy to use modern design to continue to develop as a sort of identity for Hong Kong, shifting from one kind of politics to another in which, the Hong, Kong, in, in which Hong Kong was treated as a population to mitigate the agitations connected to a variety of political and social issues. So with that claim in mind, while looking at this weird object, we'll continue. And we will continue by adding our voice to several before us, including other M plus uh, associates, T Matthew Turner, reading these events as a means to negotiate local politics with the pseudo-national identities, as the basis, uh, the basis of which would be a connection organized be between a coalition of business interests to help form uh, relationships between consumption and locality. Favorable trade deals and shaping of industries had been developing over the years, but their popularization in cultural events was novel. Over the course of three years, both the ISD and the TDC would work in tandem to develop the Expo. On the one hand, the ISD's announcement established the Expo in Japan as a horizon. Hiring Blundell was among the first steps toward this goal. He was well known, Blundell was well known, in circles in Hong Kong and had worked as a salesman uh, previously for Xerox in the UK. He would be a curator in all but title. And while the title may, be only, uh, may only be semantic, uh, in the case of the Expo, as well as the TDC's other ventures, the absence of a curator poses questions about this role in architectural exhibitions in the region. Blundell, in his position as administrative director of the pavilion, organized competitions for artwork uh, in the pavilion, alighting on two students from Hong Kong U uh, to create a mural, Mr. Ken uh, to create costumes for the women referred to incessantly in the literature on the expo and only ever as pavilion girls, as well as the constructivist culture that unfortunately exists only as an image in the archives. The architecture of the pavilion is also indicative of the strategy. The junk was both indicative of this second tendency of making an object of nostalgia in representing Hong Kong. Both Blundell and Fitch had put significant emphasis on the junk raising ceremony during the openings and special occasions. Blundell and his correspondents even claimed that the junk performance was more important for creating a positive image of Hong Kong than the content of the interior. What was at stake here was an exhibition, arch uh, was exhibition architecture, architecture that was turned inside out and seen as an object to be viewed from afar. And what we see here is uh, a news clipping. Um, Fitch had shown up at HKU to show off the work and was accused shortly thereafter of having ripped off some of the student competition, some of the student entries for the competition. Um, and I want to continue to emphasize that the architecture students mistakenly believe that this was a game of architecture while Fitch was up to other things, primarily this, this interest in creating a, 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 an image of nostalgia much more than developing an image of architecture. So if the expo was a horizon, then the second strategy, first taken up with regard to Hong Kong Week, would turn to matters much closer at hand. Again, the TDC, working in concert with the ISD and a handful of agencies, would join the BPE, whose slogan for years, Chinese people use Chinese goods. Uh, the TDC had recently redirect, redirected through what is perhaps overstating a degree of detournement. While the two strategies were pursued in parallel, the one towards the Expo and the other primarily in the BPE, the TDC worked on other projects. While these are beyond even the scope of this generous 40-minute talk, they include in brief the promotion and development of modernist architecture, graphic design, and exhibition design. Since the 1950s, American, American, excuse me, since the 1950s, America had placed stringent embargoes on Chinese products, at one point threatening the very existence of Hong Kong because it could no longer serve as an entrepot. For its survival, Hong Kong transformed into a manufacturing center and sustained its industries by differentiating them from the ones in mainland China. Some of us in the room may be familiar with Hong Kong products in the, uh, the post-World War II era uh, and that they changed their labels from things like made in China to empire made, and then finally made in Hong Kong. Such delineations, however, were always very nearly impossible as material, labor, and capital found its way to Hong Kong as always uh, with some kind of Chinese affiliation. Other than the labels, what Hong Kong had to do to secure its 
manufacturing industry was to create brands and products that were definitely Hong Kong. That was the task of the TDC. To negotiate the international politics and economic uncertainties, the colonial government turned towards design as a mediator and a way to secure Hong Kong's future. While the colonial government's effort in fostering industry in the 1960s and 70s is well known in Hong Kong's historiography, what is at stake here is that the design was used to negotiate local politics, protests, and social unrest. So now in turning towards more definitely our conclusion, we want to point out that while some of the nations played international Cold War politics, we heard earlier that the USSR and American pavilions uh, reached both high and then low to do this, and that Canada played a, the intensification of their internal politics, having a, a pavilion for the Quebecois, the, for Toronto, and for the Western contingent. Um, Hong Kong chose to play out these types of politics in one pavilion. Hong Kong's pavilion in 1970 would be uh, many things, and from it, I think we can learn that the design met, that where design met curation, Hong Kong politics were everywhere at play, even as they were barely visible.